Hey everyone, welcome to our first bezel design school. My name is Daniel and let's get started. So again, my name is Daniel. I'm an XR designer working at Bezel in San Francisco. Um, I'm quite passionate about XR, so I'm very, very happy to be here. But if you don't know what Bezel is, well, that's why we're here. So what is Bezel? Well, Bezel is a um, spatial computing um, prototyping tool that allows people to conceive of concepts in 3D and publish them to either the web, AR, or VR. And it was created by these three founders um, from Meta. And while they're at the Meta, they basically ran into the, the issue of being able to prototype things quickly. And they really wanted an XR design tool focused around like quick, rapid prototyping. But at Meta, the ability to push out a prototype often took days or weeks to get a single concept across. And so um, they got the idea to, to separate from Meta and create a tool that does just that. So Bezel's mission inherently is to create a cross-platform spatial computing platform that allows people to collaborate instantaneously, create things in 3D, and offer a powerful extended reality framework that works right out of the box. Again, Bezel's mission is to create a communal prototype that no matter what device you're on, be it phone, um, headset, or desktop, you should be able to create and express and share your concepts with everyone. And I, all of this together will help facilitate the promise of spatial computing. And so why is spatial computing important and why does it matter? Well, today spatial computing um, has a promise of tying us back to our society and to our reality. Um, for the past, you know, decades, screens have dominated the attention of our, of our society. And we have often had to live our three-dimensional lives on two-dimensional screens. And that has basically taken us away from our physical reality. And that's and that's why spatial computing is so incredibly important and so incredibly powerful. And and because um, spatial computing can tie us back to reality into phys, into the physical world, it will impact every f fashion of our society. So today designers inherently craft for frames, um, be it a billboard, a phone, a desktop or a television, but in the future we will be designing for the human body in the human form. And this will impact fashion, entertainment, e-commerce, medicine, education, and everything around us. Um, and on top of that, it's going to open up a lot of philosophical debates on what reality is and how do we define reality, which is an interesting philosophical debate we can talk about another time. Um, and I think and we think the, the first place that this will start is um, where we're going to see the biggest impact is like how XR or spatial computing will impact the context of everything we're around. But designing for this new medium often takes a lot of time to get started. So how do you start learning how to prototype for spatial experiences? Well, as I said, prototyping for new technology is notoriously difficult. Um, when a brand new technology comes out, um, key affordances and signifiers aren't there. So it takes a long time for people to understand what works. And if you want to build these experiences, you have to rely on tools not necessarily built for them. And because of that, prototyping is often a non-starter for a lot of designers. Um, I remember when I was creating mobile experiences back in 2011, 2012, the ability to prototype relied on paper prototypes. And we're going to see that a little bit more um, with today's XR. And on top of all of that stuff, um, educational content on teaching people how to do this is notoriously limited or lacking. Um, and if we look back at 2013, here was the process I had, uh, what most product designers had. Um, if you weren't using Sketch, you were often using Photoshop, Illustrator, Google Docs, Miro, Post and Notes, all of this stuff to get your concept across. But today, this has been streamlined primarily into tools like Figma. And honestly, extra prototyping today is really no different than the early era of mobile um, development and mobile design, but it's a bit different. So let's start with what is similar. Well, again, there are no established design patterns um, with for XR practical applications. Um, again, XR requires 
um, multiple tools to complete a single prototype and educational content and tools are limited but it's a little bit different this time because designers at because while designers can easily um, learn some of the same affordances for designing for like web or print um, because they're flat structures designers now will have to bend their mind around three-dimensional thinking and this means understanding a bunch of new hard skills like 3d design and theory and all that stuff can get super complicated um, but XR prototyping again is, you know, is following um, the roadmap of mobile. So, about a year ago, this is my process. I concept things out on paper, Fig Jam, um, Procreate. I use Shapes XR a little bit to get started, and then I primarily just work within Blender and Unity. Um, this year, the process is becoming a lot more streamlined for me. It's basically um, Bezel is now picking up a lot of the testing and prototyping tools um, that I needed. And then it's bringing me all the way from lo-fi to hi-fi when it comes down to testing and sharing it with my developers. Um, the ideal process by 2025, which is super ambitious, is a single tool or a few tools like Bezel will be able to handle everything a designer needs from collaboration to planning to high to low fidelity prototyping and, and in-person testing. So how are we going to get there? Well, the way we get there is through accessible tooling. So what does an accessible spatial design tool look like? Well, it needs to be multi-platform and that means phone, computer, and headset. And so why does it need to be multi? So why does it need to be multi-platform? Well, fundamentally, um, the world we live in today, everyone's adopted their lives to phones and these, and these screens. And while it would be nice if everyone had a headset that was comfortable, accessible to like use, the majority of people don't. And so we don't want to lock those people out of the XR experience. So being able to jump between a headset, a mobile phone, and the desktop will need to be baked into our society for at least the next decade. And on top of that, I believe that accessible prototyping tools for XR need to be uh, effortless for designing your like, experience. So that means like, or previewing your experience, I should say. And so what does this mean? Well, right now in Unity, if I want to view a prototype, if I have a Mac, it takes, you know, between two minutes and 15 minutes just to view an iteration. Um, if I want to send this concept to someone, it takes, I have to build it out, send it, they'd have to upload the APK to their headset. And it will just take, you know, sometimes between 20 to 45 minutes. But previewing content of what you design should be effortless and seamless no matter what where you're at. Um, another thing that's important about accessible spatial prototyping is having asynchronous and synchronous communication and collaboration. So that means while you're designing something, someone should be able to be designing with you no matter where they're at. Or if you're, say, on the bus and someone has a design you want to check out and leave a note, you should be able to do that on the bus, on a mobile device. The way we communicate is not, is the way we communicate right now, we have higher expectations that we have before and accessible prototypes should meet those. Um, the second to last um, like virtue of accessible tooling is basically it need, we need the tool needs to be accessible um, to people from every skill range. So if you're from an advanced creator who is creating complex, um, prototypes to someone who just needs to get an idea out there. Our tool needs to be accessible to everyone and help people learn the process. Um, and finally, multiple tools need to be able to work together to bridge the gap where others fail or others are not focused. So how do modern spatial prototype applications stack up today? Well, desktop applications today are primarily focused on power and development. like. Like, like Xcode and Swift, desktop programs like Unity and ARKit and Unreal are focused on development, as I said, and game engines are primarily built um, for engineers, not designers. And this becomes a major issue because designers will have to learn core engineering or game mechanics to get anything working, which can take a very long time. And depending on the device your content needs to be stored, um, being able to test that out can be a very lengthy experience. And also, yeah, and I think that kind of covers it. I mean, game engines are highly technical platforms and require a lot of code knowledge. Next, mobile um, prototyping right now is pretty popular and it's being primarily used by tools like Spark AR, 
and Lens Studio. And while this is, and while these tools are accessible because th this opens up the ability for anyone with a smartphone to actually create for them, they are often like guard. Uh, they are often placed within a garden of an application. So if you want to test that an AR experience, you have to download Snap. You have to download any meta platform and they honestly lack the concept of presence or of immersion they are just these filter machines and while those can be very powerful they lack the power of true spatial computing um and then we have standalone headsets now standalone headsets today are pretty cool because well, i should say then we have standalone headset tools um, and these creation tools are pretty cool because it allows people to design within the medium that they're actually designing for However, um, right now, the inputs that people use to create things within extended reality are very, very primitive, and they're not really, and they don't really allow for quick creation and manipulation of objects or content. And on top of that, headsets, especially standalone headsets for the foreseeable future, will be very, very limited by their computing power, and that means, like, and as a creator who is creating extended reality experiences, being able to manage a lot of assets and figure out what can go into a scene, how to use things and uh, optimize, that requires a lot of power. And headsets are just simply using a mobile GPU to get some of that done. It's just not working for standalone. Um, also, people are, if you are not designing um, within the headset, you are essentially locked out of the experience at the moment. And that's just problematic. And that's why we believe hybrid web-based prototyping is the future. Um, so, what is a hybrid web? What is a hybrid web-based prototyping tool? Well, that simply is a tool that allows people to op to use um, the mobile web browsing experience to create things on any device they're on. And I think that this has been, for the most part. Um, solidified with tools like Figma. And while Figma may be a vector-based platform um, that's on the web, back in the day, um, being able to have that kind of content being crafted on the web was brand new and unique. And today it is like it reigns supreme because of that. Um, and also the ability to have a hybrid model allows us, especially a web-based model, that allows people to basically share their work with a simple URL and it's essentially effortless, which is really, really cool. And on top of that, we are not um, we are not locked into. And on top of that, the web is not locked onto like behind the walls of an app. Um, so basically, anytime we want to make a change to an application or evolve the application, make a fix, it is done instantaneously. You don't need to push to a store. You're not limited by what the store offers. Everything is um, instantaneous. Um, so. And that's why essentially Bezel's the bee's knees. You know, Bezel is a very versatile um, platform that is incredible. That is platform agnostic. It has 3D creation tools. It has ex ex as um, seamless extra prototyping tools that make switching between AR and VR instantaneous, as well as sharing your work instantaneous. It allows people to take the skills they've learned from other um, creation tools like Figma or Sketch or Photoshop and bring them in um, to um, VR or 3D and this makes the experience a lot easier for them. <coughs> and Bezel also plays really well with other different programs. And another thing is, is that Bezel is incredibly um, collaborative. So um, you can view, comment, and collaborate no matter what device you're on, which makes it super, super powerful. And the ability to share um, a concept is only a text away or a URL away. And it can be done in collaboration, as I said before, can be done in real time or whenever is convenient. And finally, Bezel is incredibly fast and powerful. Um, we are built with to web tools that are packing, that are like honestly on pace with native tools, especially for um, native headsets. And we are not bound by the net or the app store, so that means we're, these things can just evolve really, really fast. At the moment, we allow for advanced materials, occlusion, lights, all and more, and more is coming every week, which is absolutely insane. And it is incredibly awesome that this stuff exists now. Okay, so um, to do, for a quick demo, what we're gonna do right now is I'm just gonna show you how to go through this tool really, really quickly and point out some of the benefits of it. Um, now, like many other 3D tools, we have the ability to add objects, primitives, lights, 
uh, models and stuff like that. We have a comment tool we'll talk about in a sec. We have a library. We have a library full of stuff. That's cool. Um, but I want to, the first thing I want to point out is that we have um, this nifty feature unique to Bessel called the Command Center. So like any other tool, you're going to have to um, memorize a bunch of different commands for keys to go really, really fast. But we wanted a way for people um, advanced and at the beginning to move around Bezel quickly. So if you can, so with Bezel, what you all you need to do, for instance, if I want to add a box, I can just start typing box, right? If I hit enter a space, if I double click, I have the box. If I type in, you know, let's see, say sphere, you know, I can just double click on top of this box, add it to the top of the sphere. It's spatially aware, which is really cool. If I want to add a point light, I can just do that. The point lights here. If I want to change between, say, meters and feet, right now we're in meters. Now we are in feet. If I want to change from feet to millimeters, now we are in millimeters. This allows us to manipulate the world really, really fast. Um, and it, again, it's super powerful. Um, the next thing I want to show you is the ability to comment. So if I go over here to this awesome um, box, and if I type, you know, cool box, but can we make it smaller, right? And if I um, click this, I can just say I want it to be this size. And I post it. Right, so we can do that. So now when someone comes in, they can look at this comment and they can see exactly how small we want it. And then, you know, you can even zoom in to the object and see where it's at. Super nifty gift nifty. You can archive it if you want, but this is super useful. Um, another thing that we have, let's look at, let's look at the inspector real quick. So um, we can change materials here. So if I want to change that to like to red, if I want to change the opacity, I can do that. Sweet. Let's just group these. The next thing I can also do is actually it can start animating. So if I hit add a state here, I can just add, I can change that to there. State one, state two. Um, I can then say, um, I can add an interaction. So on pointer down, which is called group one, we're going to go from base state to state one. Let's add another one that goes from group one from state one to state the base state. So if I hit um, play mode, it animates. Really, really sweet. So let me bounce out of this real quick. And what I can also do is if I throw that up, I can then say, change the color of this. Actually, it's add, um, on side of this group, let's just say I want to go from white. to blue. Cool. And as you see, it's automatically updated. And everything is updating in real time. Awesome. This is super duper powerful. Um, another thing we can do on top of lights and all that stuff is that if I, we can use occlusion. Now, if some people ask about portals, so here's how you could create a portal to another dimension if you want. So what I'm gonna do, I, you, don't, you, can, you can use any object you want, but I'm just gonna use this box. I'm just gonna make it larger. I'm then gonna go into edit mode. I am gonna use a loop cut. I'm gonna extrude it. Extrude it. Go down here. Extrude it. And then actually, why don't I just take this and let's just extrude it. Cool. Now, to paint this a little bit easier, um, to make it easier to understand, I'm just going to change my opacity of the... I'm just going to change the show environment. So now we have the sky and I can just take this wall and I can go down here to standard material, change it to colder, and now it disappears. So anything behind this wall or this geometry I made can now disappear. Really, this is super, super powerful. And with a couple of clicks, you can create pretty powerful occlusions. Great. Um, 
Now, if you guys are interested in um, playing with other files and stuff like that, feel free to go to our gallery. Here we have a bunch of different files of animations and stuff you can look at and copy and iterate on. And we would love to see all of the stuff that you're playing with on our Discord um, and on social. And if you have any questions or want to see anything, let us know on our Discord. And I'm excited to see your work, guys. And until next time, take care.